Welcome back to The Real Story, everybody. A special session of the legislature this July is going to tackle police reform in the wake of civil unrest across the nation, but it's also going to tackle something else, and that's voting. And here to talk about it is the Secretary of the State of Connecticut, Denise Merrill. Denise, it's always great to talk to you. Thanks for joining us. Yes, my pleasure. <laughs> All right, so let's jump right in. Uh, recent Hartford Current op-ed, you said legislatures should remove obstacles to participation, particularly obstacles that have been erected between communities of color and the ballot box. What are those obstacles? Well, I mean, a, a lot of the obstacles right now relate to COVID. Uh, we know that those communities are uh, severely impacted. And the question of the hour is, are people going to have to decide between their health and their vote? I say no. Uh, I don't ever want to see somebody make that choice. But we're a little bit constricted here in Connecticut with the laws about absentee balloting, which are both in the state constitution and in statute. So uh, that's what we're busy trying to figure out how we can enable particularly communities that have traditionally been sort of left out, uh, even here in Connecticut. Uh, and it's, it's not easy, but I think we're getting there. <laughs> All right. So you mentioned absentee voting. Let's go right to, to that topic. Uh, obviously, facing COVID-19, um, it's my understanding your office has actually been sued in regard to your position on this. I mean, do you worry about voter fraud when it comes to absentee ballots? You know, I'm not even sure what that means. Uh, we've been voting by absentee for over 100 years in Connecticut. Nothing has changed. It's just there probably will be more of them because more people are concerned about going in person to the polls, especially those over 60 or 65, and I have to count myself in that group, uh, you know, or people who have underlying health conditions that worry them. And so that's, that's our challenge, is making sure we can allow every everyone complete access to the vote and uh, that we should preserve at all costs. Well, to your point, from my understanding, under current Connecticut law, you can vote absentee if you have an illness, which would seem su to suggest if you have COVID-19, you'd be able to get an absentee ballot. Uh, but would the law need to be changed to include someone who just wants to avoid an illness? Uh, we think so. Uh, it's really interesting because the state constitution and the statute really have never been interpreted to figure out what illness actually is particularly under these circumstances. Now, the governor has done an executive order based on the emergency situation, the pandemic, no vaccine available. He has said, they interpreted the statute to say, we're going to allow anyone who is at risk of COVID to vote. And so the problem with COVID is we don't really know who's sick. You could be sick and have COVID and not even know it. So these are all factors that factored into our thinking in terms of who would be able to go. At this point for the primary, which is August 11th, pretty much anyone who might have COVID is worried about going to a polling place may request an absentee ballot. But that is not necessary. That does not extend beyond the governor's emergency order. Something that might be a little bit easier uh, to tackle, perhaps, than absentee voting might be the issue of early voting. I'm curious to get your thoughts on that. How would that benefit the state, and how early are we talking uh, when it comes to allowing voters to cast a ballot? We have, uh, I have proposed year after year that we have more days of voting. It would make election day a much smoother process. 39 states already have some days of voting. I kind of favor the idea of maybe an extra five days so that we could spread it out, give people more opportunity to vote and check them off the list so that we can manage the list more easily on election day. You still wouldn't know the results in advance, but it would give more people opportunity to vote. And um, we did introduce it. It would require a constitutional amendment. And that's the problem here in Connecticut, why we are one of the few states that don't allow either early voting or what we call no-fault absentee ballots. Many states, you don't need an excuse to get an absentee ballot. You can get one whenever you feel you want one. Uh, but these are in our state constitution, requires a 75% vote of legislature, and then it has to go on the ballot. And all the people of the state have to okay it before it goes into law. 
And Denise, curious to get your thoughts on this. I mean, do you think early voting would uh, increase the cost that it takes for a candidate to run a campaign since they may have to spend money on get out the vote efforts over a longer duration? No, I think other states, well, like I say, 39 states are already doing this, so there's plenty of states you can look at, and they would probably have to change their tactics a little bit, but, uh, you know, there's lots of ways to do things, and I'm sure they would figure it out. Um, would also mean they would know earlier who had already voted, so it might be easier in some ways. All right, so during the 2018 uh, November elections, we did see some balloting issues cast a shadow on the integrity of the system. There were some wet ballots, some same-day registration chaos that I remember speaking with you about. Uh, how do we avoid a repeat of that? Well, of course, if the legislature would pass the legislation I have requested, uh, that could be avoided. The Election Day registration, I think, was almost a one-time thing because it was mostly in college towns where some of their absentee ballots didn't arrive in time. You know, there are always glitches like this when you have only one day. It's sort of like giving a wedding. I like to say, you know, everything has to go off perfectly. Uh, the wet ballots, who could have predicted that, right? And in 2011, we had major storms that took out some of the polling places. The real key is to plan ahead for emergencies. So now, since all these things have happened, every town has an emergency plan. What do you do when you run out of ballots? What do you do if the ballots get wet? And we try to predict everything. I'm sure we'll never get every single thing right, but common sense usually prevails. Connecticut was one of 21 states that was targeted by Russia to hack the 2016 presidential election. How has cybersecurity, Denise, been bolstered since then, and what's been done to protect the online voter registration? Oh, that's a significant issue to this day. Um, and uh, our voter registry was the thing that was uh, attacked by Russian uh, IP addresses. They did not get into our voter registry, which is the only part of our system, by the way, that's online. Uh, your vote could never be compromised by cybersecurity because the tabulator that you vote on is not connected to the internet. And it isn't in any state in the country. So the real risk is the voter file. And uh, we have gotten several federal grants to help us bolster our, mostly our local security because that, Voter registry is managed at the local level in 169 towns. And so every town has to have the security. Every town has to be changing passwords. Every town has to be making sure that they're running the proper software with the proper protections. So we've used that federal money to do that, exactly. We have uh, consultants that have gone down and worked with towns and made sure that their security systems are in place. And we're in a much better place than we were even a few years ago. And we'll continue to work on it. And when you talk about everyone in the state having access to the right to vote, I'm uh, curious to get your thoughts. There's only two states in the country, Maine and Vermont, where prisoners never lose their right to vote. Uh, what about Connecticut? Do you believe that prisoners should be able to vote here? Uh, I, I cannot imagine how we would manage to allow prisoners to vote from prison. I do think that anyone that's back in the community ought to regain their right to vote. Uh, but uh, from prison, I, that presents enormous hurdles in terms of how do you decide where the polling place is and their living conditions. So uh, I personally uh, don't see that happening in Connecticut, uh, and it has not really happened in many other places in the country. As you say, Vermont and Maine both do allow people to vote from prison, but that's a long-standing issue. I don't think they ever took that right away from people to begin with. So uh, I haven't seen a move so in that direction here. So when you talk about back in the community, do you mean parole and probation, too? Would we allow them to vote? Well, we already do. If you're on probation, you get your right to vote back. Uh, you still have to affirmatively do that. And our biggest problem has been that people don't realize they have regained their right to vote. And so uh, we try to work with them to make them understand you're now a full-blown citizen and you should participate just like everyone else. Uh, so. But uh, yes, in Connecticut, if you're on probation, you are allowed to regain your right to vote. Uh, so far, parolees still cannot uh, regain their right to vote, but my position is I think they should. I mean, they're in the community, they should be part of the community and part of the civic life of the community.
All right, so this is something I have to ask you about. I'm infinitely curious about it. You recently set the order of names uh, for the candidates and how they'll appear on the presidential primary ballot. How is that order determined? And for the life of me, I can't figure out why are Bernie Sanders and Tulsi Gabbard still on that ballot? Oh, it's very simple. It's by statute. So once someone qualifies to be on the ballot, and don't forget, that was back in February when we were going to have a primary in April, <laughs> uh, which has since changed. Uh, so we decide, determine this over uh, looking at how much support they have nationally, whether they're in the news and so forth. Once they qualify, I cannot remove them, nor can anyone else, unless they affirmatively agree to be removed in writing. And that's obviously to prevent um, a public official to simply just remove their name. Actually, in New York, um, the New York governor canceled the primary and canceled Bernie, and he sued in court to regain the ballot, and they did go ahead and have a primary. So uh, there's just no provision in our statutes for anyone to remove someone once they have qualified. And then the order of the ballot, uh, simple. We put their names in a little jar, and I close my eyes and draw the names out and see who comes out. It's random selection. <laughs> Denise, we maybe have about 10 seconds. I hate to hold you to a couple word answer here, but I'm curious, you think election day should be a holiday? I'd prefer to see a more early voting, honestly, uh, because that way we wouldn't have to make it a holiday. People would have more opportunities all week. Uh, but, you know, I, I can see the argument, right. uh, Why? but why not 4th of July? Hey, we're coming up on the 4th. Be a great day to vote. <laughs> There you go. Secretary of the State Denise Merrill, thanks so much for joining us on The Real Story. It's always great to talk to you. My pleasure, Matt. Thanks. Uh, all right. And thank you for joining us on this edition of The Real Story. We'll be back next week. Be sure to tune in to the Fox 61 News tonight, starting at 10.